wasn't until we we went and it was the first night that I realized how amazingly haunted that place is. I mean intelligent haunting. Them talking to you. Can you please tell us what this person's name is? With the vast amount of emotion and stress and experimentation that was done there, at least uh, through word of mouth that I've heard, I think that there's a strong possibility that spirits would be stuck or trapped there uh, and that other spirits or other energies out there would be drawn to that location, making it a hotbed of activity, which I have witnessed myself. Just saw a hand come around that doorway there. I did too. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> this place is so active. It's probably one of the most active, if not the most active places that we have ever been to. Do you feel anything in that tub? Yeah. Not at the moment. <laughs> Fuck me. Oh. One location, multiple units, activity in all units, the full range of paranormal activity. It was um, a paranormal Disneyland. And walking in for the first time, it's extremely low, low. Can I get a voice in there? Yeah. Yeah, I got a voice up here. I heard something in here. Man. Okay, so. So, uh, again, we're hearing a lot of voices, and it seems like we're surrounded by, by uh, entities. Camarillo State Hospital opened in the 1930s. It housed and treated the mentally ill and the criminally insane. The hospital was at the forefront of treating diseases of the mind and developmental disabilities. However, Camarillo also has a dark history. Mysterious deaths, suicides, strangulation. Camarillo State Hospital closed in 1997 and is now a university. However, many of the original buildings of the asylum remain abandoned. These buildings have attracted paranormal investigators for many years. When I first heard of this location, it was through whispers and myth. It was the kind of place that people didn't like to talk about so much. Um, they wouldn't give you full details, but you'd hear little snippets from other investigators. And... It was one of those things, one of those times in your life when you realize during the course of whatever that is that's happening to you that this will be special, that this will stand out. Okay, guys, are ready? Okay. Cool. Let's do this. Sometimes in life you'll have this happen. Watch your lights. And you won't know about it until afterwards, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like where you go back and you go, yeah, that was really special. Kind of. Wow, you can't see it well. Is that weird, right there? Yeah, in the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, you can't see it well. Is that weird, right there? Yeah. You know, I started investigating back in 2001, so back in that time when I first started coming here, I was very, uh, very new to the paranormal field. Uh, some friends of ours from a uh, group called Ventura Haunts had called uh, myself and another friend of mine and had invited us to come down to uh, this place, which uh, I, I actually had never heard of. Uh, all I knew was that it was a former uh, state mental hospital. I was also told that uh, Richard Sennett and Dr. Barry Taft were gonna be here that night. So I was even more excited to come. Uh, we got anybody here who is a psychic? I'm, I'm real sensitive myself. Good. Very sensitive. You getting anything? We were able to gain access into what is what used to be unit number 23 and 24, uh, which are now, uh, ironically, uh, student dorms. Uh, back in that time, you were able to walk into any door here and open it up and just walk right in. Ooh. 
Uh, walking in for the first time is, was an intense feeling for me. You're hearing sounds emitting from the walls. You're hearing uh, knocking sounds. And th there's, there's so many rooms and there's so, it, it was just like one big maze. Hello? Come on, I'm doing something in there. Something in there. Hmm? Only turn up. What are you getting at picking up anything? Yeah. I felt something in that room in there. I don't, not the oh, knocking, it's just. It felt like a hot spot in there. What are you getting at picking up anything? Yeah. I felt something in that room in there. I don't, not the knocking, it's just. It felt like a hot spot in there. I went through there with some equipment I had. I had some, I had some outdated equipment. I have something called a Cyber Probe 2, which uh, was state of the art in 1981. <laughs> it's now been kind of superseded by other pieces of equipment that have similar philosophies or theories behind their usage, uh, similar to a K2 meter, very common now in ghost hunting. That all of a sudden, this thing went off like a Roman candle. Lights were flashing. Hold it up higher, maybe that'll help. Hold it up higher. Hold it up higher. Hold it up higher. Whatever it is, it's around here. I've never seen it done this, do this before. And I recorded the spot and I said, something's here. Well, they brought in another fellow from LA, a top notch a parapsychologist, uh, Dr. Taft, uh, Barry Taft. He's also a friend of mine. We've worked together on a few cases. He brought the most sophisticated equipment I have ever seen, big, large metal boxes. In fact, he had a device which actually measured variations in the magnetic field of the Earth. Pretty sophisticated. So he brought it in. I said, he said, well, where did you find this anomaly? I said, right over there. So what did you use? I showed him the K2, which almost made him burst out laughing. He said, you know, um, like there are better things out there. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I know it's old school. So I put it down and he set his equipment up, now kind of laughing to himself. He didn't think he'd get anything. But when he turned it on, you know what he received? A zero, a zero on the magnetic field. He said, that's impossible. And he checked all his connections again, and he started it up again, he restarted it, and it still read zero. He says, how is this possible? This thing should be floating in the air. This is, should be no mag gravity in this area. But we had picked up something. Construction began on Camarillo State Hospital in 1932 and the hospital began receiving patients in 1936. The vast complex of buildings sat on 1,648 acres. The land was part of Lewis Ranch, but before that, it belonged to the Chumash Indians. When we come here, we pay our respects to not only the energies that are here, the souls that are here, the memories that are here, but also to those ancestors because I think one of the things that we recognize in all the years that we've been doing this is that all those energies are connected. Uh, we believe that there is a constant flow of energy. Camarillo State Hospital was like a small self-sustained city which grew its own food and maintained livestock. The hospital became famous in popular culture the Eagles song Hotel California was rumored to be about Camarillo State Hospital. It claimed the band flatly denies. In time, uh, these facilities, these state hospitals became overcrowded and they became understaffed and underfunded. And uh, the, the conditions became terrible. And uh, they were either uh, ignored, overlooked, or sometimes even forgotten. And with indeterminate sentencing, or commitments really, uh, the mentally ill were uh, packed in together and these mental hospitals became custodial warehouses. 
Camarillo also became infamous when a nurse working there, Nadine Scola, published her diary of events she witnessed at the hospital in 1976. How can they allow such places to exist? They really need to reform, but who is going to do it? We're supposed to be civilized, and yet many people are treated worse than the lowest form of animals. Who cares about these patients? The release of Keeper of the Keys coincided with grand jury investigations. What happened was there were these two girls and they were going at it really bad. They pulled out a fire hose from the wall and they sprayed the two girls. The two girls uh, were cut up from the high pressure hose from the water and one of the girls, the skin was practically almost ripped off her. Camarillo staff were accused of overdrugging patients with a tranquilizer cocktail known as the number one. Now, I do recall that uh, the initial excitement about um, uh, Thorazine and so on kind of gave way to um, uh, an interest in electroconvulsive therapy. First um, uh, introduced by uh, an Italian psychiatrist and uh, they, they used to call it Edison medicine, the patients. For me, Camarillo State Mental Hospital was probably in its heyday uh, both a place of great pleasure where kids could play and be around other kids that had the same um, handicaps as themselves uh, as well as learning to help rehabilitate certain people but however there's always a darkness around these places because of the type of mental distress that a lot of the subjects in the location were experiencing. This can also draw in negative forces, possibly non-human forces, on a spiritual level as well to feed off of those uh, you know, anxiety emotions or fear emotions or anger emotions and it becomes sort of a hotbed for activity on both sides with the human as well as the non-human beings. There's a lot of weird suffering or, or bad treatment that happens and I think it keeps a lot of, even if it's only residual, it keeps a lot of activity happening because it's saturated in the location. Uh -huh. In Camarillo they did do shock therapy, they had um, people that were severely, severely aggressive psychotics that they kept on lock and key there. And when you have those kind of people in a space that's going to transmit into the building blocks of that location, into the ground of that location. And I think it only creates for kind of a perfect storm of activity. Can you tell us where you're from? Are you from Camarillo? Are you from Los Angeles? Downey? Long Beach? And I think that particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on uh, a snake pit. The doctor invited me to see the conditions he was talking about, so unannounced and unexpected by the school administration, we toured building number six. The doctor had warned me that it would be bad. It was horrible. In 1972, Geraldo Rivera paid a surprise visit into the Willowbrook institution, exposing the inhuman conditions the children still lived in. There was one attendant for perhaps 50 severely and profoundly retarded children. Lying on the floor naked and smeared with their own feces, they were making a pitiful sound, a kind of mournful wail that it's impossible for me to forget. This is what it looked like, this is what it sounded like, but how can I tell you about the way it smelled? It smelled of filth, it smelled of disease, and it smelled of death. While no patients from Willowbrook have been confirmed to have transferred to Camarillo, Former staff have acknowledged transfers from the East Coast did indeed take place. So you went in in what year? 1963. I was 15 and I only spent 90 days 
Camarillo. In Camarillo. But in those 90 days, it felt like a lifetime. So I remember in uh, 2010, uh, they had a, a, a ceremony at Camarillo, and I was invited to, to give a talk about Camarillo. Uh, the situation was there was more of people there who were too out to show that Camarillo was not, uh, the, let's use the term, the snake pit. Okay. Camarillo at the time really was a snake pit. Okay. No matter what other people may say. Screaming, yelling uh, from everything of like if they were in, in a uh, isolation room, get me out of here, or they were screaming uh, their own voices in their heads. And I was watching uh, men walking around doing what we called back in those days the Thorazine Shuffle, and then later on it became the Prolixin shuffle, and now I don't know, it's another name, it's called another shuffle. My favorite experience, I was there filming uh, with a friend of mine, Bill Murphy. We were trying to put some project together, and while off investigating with one of the uh, focus of this, this project, we started hearing what we labeled the Thorazine shuffle, which is the sound of slippered feet skidding down the hallway, coming closer and closer in that location by ourselves, just the two of us. I will tell you, for somebody else who was a seasoned investigator, uh, he looked pretty scared. We're getting ready to leave. Is there anybody in the hallway that wants to say something before we leave? We're getting ready to leave. Is there anybody in the hallway that wants to say something before we leave? So we were in the adolescent slash autistic ward of the hospital and to me that was my favorite. The energy felt a lot better than a lot of the other places on campus. Um, it wasn't a dark energy. Uh, there was a lot of confusion that I felt, but the same confusion consisted throughout the hospital. But because it was a juvenile ward, I felt more comfortable. I feel so bad for you. Who are you looking for? Someone. 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 Is it your mommy? Are you waiting for your mom to pick you up? I heard a female voice right now. Down this way? Down that way. Yeah. Did you do? Yes, I did. Ask again, Becky. Are you looking for your mom? When's she going to pick you up? We, we tried ITC, uh, Instrumental Transcommunication. Um, that was very successful in Camarillo. We have somebody new with us. Can you please tell us what her name is? Can you please tell us what this person's name is? We wanted to see if we could get actual uh, physical manipulation of objects, so we uh, would always be at the 99 cent store picking up things. Uh, beach balls, baby powder, go in and uh, the idea was to see if we could um, put the beach ball in the middle, spread the baby powder around it, and enough so if anybody actually tried to reach in and touch it, they would leave some sort of marking. Um, the idea was we were going to leave it there and go on with the investigation. Strange. Okay, we have about a five-foot perimeter around the beach ball, so there's no way anybody could even lean in and grab it. Do you want me to give you the phone? Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, cool. I got you back. You guys there? 
Okay. Um, just let me know how we're doing on time or if you need to break in or anything. Okay, the ball's moving. The ball's moving. The ball's actually moving right now. The ball's moving. What the hell? It's moving. The ball is moving. The ball's moving. I'm just, we're checking right now for any kind of air. Trying to see if there's any air coming It out. moved to the left. Well, I guess we, uh, we did receive slack one time for, um, because of the baby powder. Um, we left it on the floor, and we did not sweep it up. Um, there was other teams that came in and thought that that was um, us kind of disrespecting the building. And, um, and I, you know, I didn't bring a broom. I don't know, um, but, um, you know, uh, investigators become very, um, they have this weird ownership when it comes to Camarillo, and that, I think that that was really just part of it, so, um, sorry about the baby powder. <laughs> this is really trippy, um, I keep seeing this everywhere we go in here. There's just tons of batteries. Piles. Oh. Piles and piles of batteries all over the place. Tell them what happens to our batteries every time. Yeah, our batteries so far, in the times that we've been here, they, get, they get drained out, like, really quickly. Even if we, like, get, like, you know, brand new ones, or we, we use our rechargeables or whatever, they always get sucked up. But what's really trippy is to find these piles of batteries all over the place. Separation during investigating Camarillo always happened, especially if we would bring new people, new investigators with us, or relatively new, um, it would always happen. For some reason, it's almost like a mind trick that happens when you're there. And we will tell them, you know, you need, no matter how much you want to, don't go off by yourself. You know, how much, no matter how much you're drawn to a certain area, get us and we'll all go together. It happens every time. I've encountered even people that are relatively scared of the dark will go off by themselves there at that location only. And they, w they wouldn't know why. Maybe they were just trying to distract us to get us out of the room for a second. I think so. Let's go check. Buildings here at Camarillo tend to separate us when we're inside. It's happened uh, several times here during uh, our investigations when we come with a, either a small group or a large group. And during the investigation, the investigators tend to wander off. And even, even though we've, we've, uh, we try to stay together, it, it, it happens where I think I have somebody next to me or behind me, and all of a sudden they're gone. And then we find that the other investigators are in different locations throughout the building, and then we have to go on a search for them. Uh, and it's, it's something that, that we have to be very cautious of. And for some reason, the energies here at Camarillo seem as though they want to separate us and keep us separated for whatever reason. Uh, we haven't figured that out yet. Uh, but it's something that happens every time here, and uh, it's something that I caution uh, to this day, investigators coming in here is to make sure we stay together as a group and not wander off. And hear your voice, and you hear your voice, and say hello to us. And hear your voice, and you hear your voice, and say hello to us. I began coming to Camarillo in 1998, and I remember my daughter was five years old. That's why I remember it. She didn't want to be here. But I wasn't going into the buildings or anything. I was actually coming here to take photographs. While walking through the campus location, I've probably taken close to 8,000 photos. Going into the buildings um, alone, at a, I, in the beginning, alone, just not far, venture far in, because I had met the security that patrolled the uh, um, university's grounds, and he indicated that he only sweeps the building once a month, so if the doors were to lock behind me, I would be stuck. <laughs> so I would not venture too far in. And while doing this, I began to hear things. You know, I wasn't 
interested in the paranormal. I didn't even, it wasn't even something that entered my mind. But while here, photographing, I started to hear footsteps, voices, and I'm like, am I alone in this place? And I was. And so I was no longer taking pictures. I was bringing now my recorder. A young boy was brought onto Ward 44 for drug use. He screamed to get out, begging to be unlocked from his unit. The screams were so loud we heard them on our unit, but no one paid any attention. In his frenzy and fear, he took the mattress off his bed, placed it to the door, and set himself on fire. He was finally found three hours later because his body fluids were seeping out from under the locked unit door. He was burned to a crisp. One particular building stands out the most to me, I think. Um, uh, they tell me that it was Unit 44. Um, just walking into this building, I... I uh, it just had a pit in the bottom of my stomach. Um, very hard to breathe. And uh, just investigating the area. And they turned, and there was an elderly man there, 70, 80 years of age. And he was angry. He just seemed like an angry man. Probably what I'm going to be when I hit 70 or 80. But uh, it, it, he came, as soon as I spotted him, he was coming at me. Like he knew I was already there. From what I thought, he was solid to walking right through me. And I have never, in my entire experiences investigating, have ever experienced anything like that. And I don't really think I want to experience that again. Uh, a lot of the EVPs that we've gotten in these units actually tell stories, and some really sad ones. Uh, one in particular that, that's always sticking out is unit number 44, which is, in my opinion, was probably the most active unit anywhere here on campus, anywhere. And uh, we, after several trips of coming into Unit 44, which was an upstairs unit, um, we kept hearing the footsteps, uh, uh, there were heavy footsteps coming down the hallway. And many of us encountered this. And a lot of times we thought it was someone else that had gone, came into the unit after us. So we would peek out of a, of a hallway and look, and there was nobody there. And it kept happening over and over and over. In Unit 44, there seemed to be a very dark, male presence and um, I believe that it was probably a human spirit um, and I believe that he was trying to make himself look bigger and worse than he actually was. After a while we started discovering EVPs in our recorders from a threatening male. It was a male threatening us actually is what it was um, and he was very aggressive and uh, he, no matter how many of us were in, in there in that unit, he, he, was, uh, he was not afraid to come up to us. And, and I could tell you this because the, the EVPs that we caught were very close to the recorder. I mean, I'm talking probably within a couple of feet. Finally got upset with it one night and don't usually do this. Um, it wasn't a Zach Baggins deal. But we pretty much confronted this entity and we walked him down the hall. And it was a very interesting thing because um, we could actually feel him moving backwards. The evidence we got and we, we would physically see a large black mass of a man, like a tall man that you would see him and then turn the lights on and he wouldn't be there, but we would all see him. And we think it was actually the footsteps from him. I had holy water 
and this was years ago, and this was be I learned a valuable lesson that evening. Well, this night, I don't know what I was thinking. I basically wanted to, without telling anybody, bless the water therapy tub. And I basically kind of squirted across in this tub in the dark. And everybody around me, they're, you know, right then is when everybody is like, okay, be quiet. You know, we all heard the footsteps. I felt like there was fingers around my throat, just like choking me. And I was gasping for air and coughing and everybody's, you know, telling me to be quiet. Like, you're ridiculous, you know, quiet. We need to be quiet. And I couldn't even breathe, let alone talk to, explain to them that I was choking. Rebecca's story is compelling because her using the holy water could denote some sort of negative energy there, non-human energy that you know, attacked her for trying to do something uh, which we would perceive as positive. However, the two possibilities are there. One, that yes, it was some sort of demonic energy that was in the space trying to get some retribution on her for using holy water. Or B, which is also just as likely, you're in a place that was built for crazy people. So, you come into somebody's space when they're alive and you start doing weird things, they may outlash at you for no reason other than they just didn't like the way it looked when you did it. So I think those two possibilities, I would lean more towards the fact that it was probably a deceased spirit of somebody who was obviously experiencing mental uh, distress and they were taking it out on her because she was there, she could feel them, she could see them and that's just how it goes. I mean the one problem with being empathic or spiritually open is that it's not just that you can see them, they can see and feel you. And we can interact with each other even if it's only on a base level at certain times. We're going to be coming through here, okay? What's that sound? Lewis! Did you hear that? That was not Lewis. Yeah. Lewis! We're going to be coming through here, okay? What's that sound? Lewis! Did you hear that? That was not Lewis. Yeah. Lewis! That was not him. I know. It was behind us. I know. I'm not afraid of you either. Oh wow, it's got a hold of me. Let's go. No, 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 don't run, don't run, don't run, don't run. Don't ever run. Come here. No, 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 come here. Don't ever run. <laughs> and and you know what I'm gonna tell you is, is very hard for me to say because uh and we gathered this information over several investigations, probably over a couple of years. Some of the UPs that we caught in that shower room were very disturbing. Uh, yeah, and from what we gathered, she was a patient, a young female patient, that was possibly sexually assaulted or raped. And a few, on a few other occasions, we did capture the, the same female voice whimpering, crying as well. Uh, so it was very sad, uh, very emotional. Even now, when I think about her, it's very sad because we tried going in there many times to try and help her, trying to get her out of there, trying to talk to her. We lit candles for her. We, we did so much in there to try and help her get out. And it was really sad a couple of times where we, we, we couldn't get in there to help her um, because, you know, the door was locked. And, and, you know, we came with that mindset to come into Unit 44 for that reason because we knew that male spirit that was there was, was for some reason trying to prevent us from going into that shower room. Um, but we didn't care. We wanted to get in there because we wanted to speak to that female and, and, and get her out of there and try and cross her over. Um, and we tried many times. Unfortunately, we don't think that we were able to. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of times where I, I think about her and it's just, it gets, it's, I get emotional just thinking about it because, um, you know, I just feel like she was trapped there, and I, I feel like she's still there. 
and because of what happened to her, she she can never leave. It's in her consciousness. It's still a state hospital. She's still committed there. She can't get out, and she's being held there. Now, when we hmm? when we close the door, when we leave, are you able to open that door? Well, the the knob opens. It's not locked, so we'll be able to open it. Now when we, hmm? when we close the store when we leave, are you able to open that door? Well, the, the knob opens. My family has a connection um, not only to this hospital, but to the valley here. And we have Native American ancestry from Camarillo. Um, we descend from an ancestor who was from a village that is actually not too far away from this, this hospital, this place. Every time we come here, they have stories to tell. They want to be heard. And I think that some of them enjoy the fact that we're here and we're giving them that opportunity. That makes me happy. During one investigation, they put down some crayons and a ball and they put down a toy car. And so we came back a little while later and I can't really recall if, if the ball had moved or if the car had been moved, but phenomenally, uh, there was drawing on the wall. One of the crayons had been moved and there was just, I, I get, I'm so blown away by that. They used the back, the bottom. Yeah. Sure did. Can you come up and ask if that is it? No. Hello? No. It's more. And it was really cool just to see that and to see them, you know, drawing with those crayons. Pretty remarkable. Over the past 10 years, there have been many reports of construction workers frightened off the job while working in the old buildings. We spoke to some of these construction workers as they were going on their lunch break. They asked not to be filmed, but they did tell us about some of their disturbing experiences working on the old Camarillo buildings. Everywhere, anywhere they're at. Right. Even the stuff that's barely built. Or yeah. stuff that's yeah. been rebuilt. <laughs> stuff that's been rebuilt, yeah. yeah. The library? The library. That's the library has a lot of activity? I used to be the morgue. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They invited us to look around the current building they were working in until they returned from their lunch break. During this daytime walkthrough, a very clear and loud disembodied voice was captured on four different recorders, including the onboard camera mic. I heard it too, but I thought it was the girls. Oh, it was over here. Yeah. I heard it on the record. I'm listening with headphones, I heard it. Sid and I were just inside this shower room or surgical room possibly and as I stepped out here in the hallway I uh, just recorded, uh, actually before I recorded I did hear an audible uh, voice of AVP that sounded like yes and then that's when I asked him did you say something? He said no. Um, there was nobody in this area, immediate area here so uh, we just played back the audio right now and we did get the EVP on the recorder on the playback right now. hear my voice in the background, so I'm, I've got a deeper voice, so I'm just, that's not going to be me. It's, it's right on top of him. The two females were down, way down at the other end of the hall. 
We can barely even hear yeah, this. Yeah, right on top. Yeah. Well, this is like right here. Yeah. It's right here. We played uh, audio for the construction workers uh, that were in that building, um, and they were just amazed at uh, what we had caught. In fact, uh, they were pretty frightened and uh, were afraid to walk down the, uh, the hallway uh, with us. Examination. Look at that over there. You got something like Camarillo uh, State Hospital is by far the most uh, this terrifying place I've ever been in. Even during the daytime, I feel the energy there. I feel drawn to it somehow. Like I just, for a while, I just wanted to keep, I wanted to keep going back there, and I wasn't sure why. I, I did feel like something attached to me. I think the second or third time I was there. I went home and I didn't want to get out of bed for a couple days. I felt very depressed. I just had no energy, just something very sad. So I ended up having to sage my house and bless it because it, it was just a very bad feeling that I had. This was with a couple group members and we decided to go into one of the rooms that was empty and we were talking about if it was like maybe a padded room because there was some something on the walls it just looked like something had been peeled off of it and as soon as i w walked in the doorway i asked who was there with us and then i heard that man's voice is anybody in here with us yes, yeah. is anybody in here with us yes, yeah. all right if you keep going a few doors down to the right is a mark. Peter James, I had known actually from sightings. I used to watch sightings. I used to love sightings. I couldn't miss sightings when I was a kid. So getting to meet Peter James the first time was a, was a thrill for me because I, I, he was just instantly recognizable to me. I mean, with that white hair and the, the black mustache, I mean, he's an icon. I just had the good grace to be part of this group that he took under his wing. He was exceedingly generous with SCSPR because of his affection for Frank and for Lewis. Um, and then I got to ride on the coattails, really. Uh, Peter wasn't well, and so a large part of my day there was just being worried about uh, Peter's mobility and his, his, how long he could go, how long he could walk before he needed to rest, whether staying hydrated, the things that he needed to be concerned about. Peter, Peter was a wonderful man. We lost a great deal when he passed away, or passed on, which would be a little more accurate. Uh, he was a wonderful man. Uh, my wife was a gifted psychic, Debbie, uh, and he worked together and had many adventures and misadventures on the Queen Mary. You might make note of this room, A143. There's a lot of... Uh, Resistance here, Mars. like it's like I'm. It's, all, it's it's very cool right here as I speak, and uh, it's like a sensation of don't go through, don't go in. But you know me, guys. There's a couple of kids down here. There's some children down here. Listen. There are children in here. Sadly, I wasn't part of the uh, work with him here at the, uh, right. the, the college, but um, fantastic man. I, I loved his efforts. I loved the fact that he was so honest and true to himself. He didn't take any BS from anybody. There's voices, there. There's voices here. here. Listen. Hello? Hello? Who's here? I remember walking through one of the units 
and he was he was almost running into spirits uh you know as he was walking down the hallways and going into different rooms and like you said he was pretty honest and, and up front and if he he didn't feel anything he would tell you straight up i'm not feeling anything and i remember that night when we brought him here he just he kept walking and kept going and, and he did actually find a uh, a bathroom where where uh, he thought there was an incident there where something had happened uh sadly to a little girl go ahead okay. go ahead now, this, someone, someone died in this bathroom, someone was murdered in this bathroom, and what I'm feeling, now, let me preface it by saying, I don't make up stories. Okay, I don't sensationalize. This is my sense that someone was murdered, someone was, was stabbed to death or cut to death here. Just a hello? Yeah, there's, there's a definite presence in here, and it feels female, by the way. Female. Now, this is for the record. What I'm feeling, and hopefully we can, we can, we can, we can uh, research this. There's a young girl who was murdered in this bathroom. She was stabbed to death or her throat was cut. Her name was Anne, or Annie, is what I'm getting. Uh, that's the name I, I feel here. Anne, Anna, Annie. Frank was sort of actually, I don't know if you would mind me saying it, uh, but he was sort of a protege of Peter James in a way. Peter was, I felt, quite interested in nurturing Frank's sensitive side. He was very open, I think, to hearing what Frank had to say, what impressions he might have. And, you know, Frank's a very gentle spirit He's a very gentle person that you can tell is, nat is naturally sensitive and maybe not even in like a paranormal sense, but he's a sensitive person. And that location, I think, was perfect for him in a lot of ways. Can you describe how you're feeling again, Frank? Um, right now, I'm sensing my sleeve moving almost like someone's tugging at it. And I'm not even moving my arm. It's okay, sweetie. Don't be afraid. We're friends, okay? Like slightly moving. It's right here. I can sense you right here. Oh my god, that's crazy. Are you gonna show us something? You can stand back. Go ahead. Are you gonna show us something? You can stand back. Go ahead. Unit 26 has a long hallway. I um, was leaning against the wall. My back was really, really sore. And um, the nurse had told me to take some medication for it. And I'm like leery because my doctor had changed my medication. And Sid starts talking again to the spirit saying, you should judge by the pain and not by the time frame. Don't wait X amount of hours, you should take it. And he's no longer talking to me. He's talking to the spirits around him. And so I decided, all right, I'll take a half. <laughs> so I pull it out of my pocket, and I get the bottle. And you can hear on my um, recorder, when I played it back, you can hear the bottle shaking. So you can hear the um, pills. And after um, you hear the pill bottle, you hear a male voice. Um, he is saying, take them all. Am I not right about the medication? You pay attention to the pain of the hours. Medication? Am I not right about the medication? 
meditation, we pay attention to the pain of the hours. You know, I didn't hear that until I went home and played back my recordings. And I thought, gosh, that was so mean. <laughs> I thought that wasn't very nice at all. But um, that just tells me that they're there. They, they can, I don't know if they can see us, they can hear us, or what, what we look like to them, but they're there. And it, they can hear and, you know, they know what we're doing. <laughs> I witnessed being right next to another investigator, a female, a very nice girl that actually got like scratched. You hear that? Yeah. Oh, ow, ow, ow. What? Ow, ow, ow. What? Fuck oh, me. What's going on? Sorry, tell me. Like something just. Like. Did you? No, like scratched. It's just your bra right there, no. Do you feel like you're scratched right now? Where at? It just felt like it was like quite like stinging. Can you can we look down the back of your shirt? Of course you can. Anytime you get direct contact, like physically hurt, that's frightening because they have that power. <clears throat> and I don't believe that um, they can do that all the time. Make contact or physically harm you. I think it's the stronger um, stronger spirits that can do that and when they get that strong that is something to worry about exactly yeah. let me see three. Oh, holy crap I'm gonna take this off Hold on. so that's right there where she pointed that's where it hurts right where she touched it. yeah. I'm sorry it's right here yeah that's looks like three marks right on going down where we were finishing up some EVPs and um, you know it's you know I looked out in the hallway and uh, I saw a full body apparition of a man dressed in white with red hair he startled me I yelled and began a chin reaction and the girl started screaming and and you know Frank's going ah what 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 that's not a boy, it's a man. That's a man. <laughs> what? What? What's wrong, dude? What? 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 We ran out the hallway, investigated, and there was no one there. I, he didn't seem see-through to me. He seemed solid, white uniform, and the red hair just stood out. And he looked like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? In Unit 25, there's an upstairs bathroom. It's painted black, and after looking throughout all the buildings over the course of many years, that's the first bathroom I've ever come across painted that particular color. So I'm thinking it may have been painted for a movie scene or a video of some sort. But the bathroom itself is very interesting. There is a bathtub in the center, and above the bathtub is a mirror, and if you were sitting in the bathtub and you were to look at the wall, there's another mirror. So there are two mirrors opposite, you know, the bathtub. Do you have a patient? Why? Not shock therapy? Shock therapy. Just, if you sit there in the bathroom, maybe with a digital recorder running, and just listen, you can hear the footsteps. You hear movement around, so there's still activity. And you get a feeling in your gut feeling that it's not a good place. It's not, it's just not, nothing good happened there. It was bad. They hurt you while you were here, didn't they?
Thank you. We were doing some communications. We were asking common questions. Can you knock on the wall? Um, can you slam a door? Um, but we didn't get any responses, so we just kind of moved on and um, a little ways down. We put one of the investigators in the tub. We wanted to try that, and as he, he was in the tub, get ready to start with door slam. Do you feel anything in that tub? No. Not at the moment. <laughs> Fuck me. Oh. Are you pissed that we're in here? Are you scared? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's here? That was very nice. Doors just don't slam on their own. We're very impressed. I don't know why I collect things online I can buy on eBay that have to do with the hospital and I just enjoy having them. I don't I don't feel much of an obsession with it now because I haven't been there maybe over about a year and a half. But when I do go, I want to go back. I strongly feel that um, the Cal State University system is wrong. They're trying to totally sweep everything under the rug, that, that nothing was there, there was no mental hospital, and I think that does a disservice and is, is um, wrong. So I know many people suffered there. I've heard many stories. I have books on it. I've read and researched everything you could on the hospital itself. And um, I know it was terrible conditions there. And I think the energy is always going to be there, no matter what they do to the place. And I don't think they should have turned it into a school. Um, I think it was a bad idea. And I think the people there want a voice, and that's why they are coming through to us, because we are trying to understand them and what they went through. See, these patients, so these spirits that are still here, that still remain, um, it's still an operating hospital in their consciousness. And, um, you know, we have to walk in with a lot of respect. I think one of the problems a university has now is they're trying to cover up their past. They're trying to pretend that this was never a mental hospital. And it was. And rather than try to hide it or shield it or cover it up, they should embrace their heritage. They should call like their student union the snake pit. Because part of that classic uh, award-winning film, The Snake Pit, was shot right here and based on the events that happened here at this place. I think they should, if they ever get a football team, rather than call it the Dolphins, they should call it the Maniacs, you know? Embrace their uh, heritage, maybe have their mascot in a straight jacket or something. Uh, they should realize they were a uh, mental hospital and a successful one. A lot of people checked in and didn't get better, but a whole lot of people did who came here and were cured of their mental illnesses. And it was a su successful venture. So look at the positive side of their past, not just the negative and the ugly side. Ooh, what do we got here? Books. History. <laughs> <laughs> Existence is a series of dots, stars in the sky. It's my opinion from observing people that are in the community and outside, just in life in general, that we as a species tend to connect those dots in whatever way best fits our psychology. So if we're raised religious, we're going to see in the sky an image that corresponds to that thing that we've been raised with. If that's actually a part of us emotionally, if we have some actual belief in whatever that thing is. If we're totally skeptical, if we're totally athe atheist uh, or non-theist, it's we connect the dots in such a way that it's just dots. <laughs> you know, we always, but we, there's that, I, I don't know if I'll pronounce it right, but there's a, that concept of pareidolia, of yeah. 
yeah, of, yeah, I, of I don't know, it's, of seeing shapes in clouds and, and, and we project and apply onto that cloud whatever shape, you know, in that moment makes sense for us. And it's, it's within us. It's our own psychology that does it. Skeptics are people that are open to both sides of an argument, but they come with an unwavering sense of judiciousness to it, where they are able to see the facts that are presented before them and then make a conscious decision after these facts have been presented. Not all the facts in the paranormal community have been presented yet. And, and I hate to say it, there are accounts that go back as far as the Epic of Gilgamesh and Sumeria of ghosts. And if we haven't proven it yet, I don't think we ever will. I don't think there's any solid proof because belief is so varied and so widespread and you know we've had thousands of years to come to a conclusion and I think it's all a personal journey it's our journey within us to see whether or not we want to believe we don't want to believe and how that we're gonna let that affect us and and we we'd heard little things like yeah that song Hotel California was written about Camarillo and and then I, I'd look it up and they would say, no, it wasn't, you know. The eagles themselves would say, no, it wasn't, you know. But what I started noticing is that everything that had to do with this place was more like a ritual for us. And ritual is important. Um, some people get it from church. Some people get it from, you know, different things they do. This was like, it was like a ritual. Whenever we would turn, I believe it's from Lewis Road onto the main street in Camarillo, we would play Hotel California. And as we would drive down the long winding road, it was pretty crazy, but the song, the feeling, the location, everything seemed to fit right into place. What's really kind of crazy about that is um, that Frank would also play Hotel California and the same spot that we would start playing it. But I didn't know that's what he did. <laughs> so it was really kind of weird. It was like a weird, like, what? You know, you did that right here? And he's like, yeah, every time I come. I never really wanted to be tied to one location. There's certain groups out there that have always wanted to be tied to one location and say, this is my location, this is ours, you know? And I never wanted that to happen. So I, I decided that we were not going to go there any longer. And um, I feel good about that decision. I talked to one of the ladies who works out here. She's a, a clerk, and a lot of her work is typing. And I asked her, well, you know, a... Uh, ghosts or anything around that you've encountered and she said no no there are no ghosts here and uh, then she added this she said whenever I do my work I always wear a headset and listen to music I said okay why do you do that and she said oh it keeps the screams out I didn't pursue it any further I do see myself coming here uh, for a long time, as much as I can. Here's an old piano here, left by. That's me playing the piano. Can you play us a tune, Spirit? Can you hit one of those keys? There's a special bond here, and I feel like the spirits here have gotten to know me over so many years. In fact, I can tell you because of the EVPs that I've caught, where uh, I keep hearing my name called out. And I've also caught it on the recorder uh, a couple times. So I know that I've built a rapport with the spirits here and they've gotten to know me and trust me. And I think that's the biggest part uh, of the investigations that I've done here is that they've gotten to know me and trust me and know that I'm not here to hurt them. I'm trying to help them. And I'm always looking for ways to get them to communicate to me and to get them to 
or at least help them understand that they don't have to be here anymore, that this hospital is no longer an operating hospital and they can move on. And I will continue to come here as, as much as I can to continue that work. Listen.